Locker maintainer, kind of separately from that, but it is what I do day to day. I just kind of get a paycheck for it, which is cool. Um, so kind of like what my day-to-day -day job is like is uh, looking at the open source repo itself, um, reviewing pull requests, and adding new features to Docker. Um, we get like over 200 pull requests a week. Um, so between the five maintainers from Docker, the company, and outside maintainers from like Google, Red Hat, um, IBM, we all kind of, as a collective effort, review all these PRs and then also manage to get in some features as well. So the talk today is kind of be, gonna be more of a like brain dump on all things containers. Um, I love Docker and I love um, just the concept of using all these Linux uh, concepts into creating this like container that you know and love today. Actually, like who in here has used Docker before? Okay, cool, nice. Um, so yeah, this will be like building up from the basics and then doing various things in Bash to make a container and using Run C and using Docker. So kind of everything. Cool. So starting with like what is a container? Because um, I think most people try to think of it as like a physical element that can be built or just appears as is. And it's not. It's actually just like a bunch of these, you know, um, things that are existing in the Linux kernel put together to create what you know of as a container. And the two main ones are namespaces and control groups. Um, so actually, when we even started adding the concept of containers to Windows, we um, got the Windows like kernel developers to start adding namespaces to Windows. So like, it's a lot of these like aspects that really just like make up what is a container. Um, so as far as control groups go, uh, there's various different ones, and these limit what the process can use. Um, so namespaces limit what the process sees, and control groups limit what it can use. So this could be like memory, CPU, you can define a certain CPU set to be used, um, block I.O., network, devices, um, it's basically everything. Um, so with regard to memory, sorry, I'm going to go through these really fast because I have like old demos after. <laughs> um, memory can be like physical memory, kernel memory. You can get OOM notifications, which is actually better than not doing it because otherwise uh, it will just stop. Um, so if you do an OOM notification, it's more like a soft limit. Uh, CPU C group uh, keeps track of CPU time, usage. You can set weights to different percentages. Um, CPU set is pinning to a specific CPU, so you can do CPU set zero, CPU set one, so on and so forth. Um, block I.O. is throttling for devices. Um, so you can do read and write throttling and control all sorts of that. Actually, one of my ideas for using this was to stop a um, the archive bombs, like the tarball within tarball within tarballs, like tarballs all the way down. Um, if you set the like write limit specifically to really, really low, and you had an archive bomb, it would take like maybe seven years to unpack. Although technically, if you're gonna do that, you might as well just do a read-only container. It would be a lot easier. Um, but it's kind of a cool idea. Uh, so with regard to namespaces, there's a pin namespace, net, mount, UTS namespace, IPC, and user. Um, these are usually done with clone or unshare. And so yeah, I have a few things for this. Um, you keep track of files in proc, pid, ns. Um, when the last process in a namespace dies, the entire namespace itself is destroyed. It's kind of nice. You don't even have to think about it. Um, it just goes with it. Um, and you can re-enter a namespace that has already been created with the process still running with NSenter, which is a like Linux utility just like Unshare. So network namespaces creates its own uh, like network interfaces. So you could have your local, you could have an etho, you could have like a tunnel, you could have whatever you want. You start from the ground up and go from there. Um, so just to show how you could do this in Bash. Um, 
So technically, this is my house right now. If I do like an IPA, I have all this stuff. Like there's some crap for some containers I'm running, the Wi-Fi, etc. So now if I do, let's see, my checklist. Nice. Uh, unshare is like one of the easiest commands to show how namespaces works. It just creates various different namespaces via flags. So net is assigning a new network namespace. So if we do an IPA in there, then you'll see that all we have is local. So technically I could start a process in there and then I could use like IP set and S and set up all my network interfaces or I could create two VET pairs on the host and um, clone one into the container, which is actually how the Docker bridge works. Um, so yeah, it's like a very simple example. Um, moving on. Oh, that was for something else. Okay, so uh, UTS namespace is more just like hostname, getting and setting. Um, so there's like a super easy, like my hostname here is Debian. Um, so I can also do the same thing with like I'm just going to set the host name in the container to thing and then echo it back out. So it's thing, and I'll, I'll prove to you that my host name didn't change. So that's really cool. That's how you get like your fun little like root at whatever in your container. IPC namespaces are for like message queues and um, Shared memory, um, so just to show an example of that with unshare. I'm gonna create a message in my queue on my host. Um, so it, now if I look at the queue on my host, Uh, you can see that I have like a few different messages here. Um, and then if I do it with unshare, it should be empty. So yeah, that gives you like your own separate namespace for that. Um, user namespaces is, um, it's the newest of the namespace aspects in the kernel. Um, it's slightly buggy in the fact that um, various things can escalate from you being root inside the container to all of a sudden you're root on the host again via like kernel vulnerabilities. Um, so just be aware of that. Um, but it does work really well when it works. So um, the way it works is by mapping a UID and GUID on, um, in the container to different IDs on the host. So the way we implemented this in Docker is to create a random range like of a huge like UID and then it will remap zero in the container to like this random number on the host. Um, and then it will just keep going from there. So if it's like zero in the container 991, then it's like one in the container 992. It iterates up and like the kernel kind of does all that thought process for you once you set the right mappings in like proc files. Um, so I'll, I'll show an example. So like technically this is just all the crap on my host and it's owned by me, obviously. Um, so if I do a user namespace, it's going to change it to nobody and no group. Um, which is really nice. But if you actually map the files, since we put nothing in proc, um, it will be what you mapped it to, um, which is really cool. Then there's also mount namespaces, um, and you can mask certain file paths like proc and sys. Um, and this is how you get like the rootfs for your container. And then there's a pin namespace where you can see like obviously on your host, you can see all the PIDs and then in the container, you can see just the PID that's running and maybe any other children or threads that are also running. So cool, okay. 
Now I can actually show what I wanted to show. That was the end of that. Okay, so that's cool. And like unshare will only get you so far because obviously like we couldn't do like crazy crap. Uh, but it is cool for just showing like a uh, very simple namespace. Okay, so um, the way that run C actually works is it gives you a config file for all your container type things to set. So if I just go into one of these basics ones, um, in this directory, I just have this config.json and then my root of s. And um, sorry, hang on, like really pussy. So the root of s I just got from like a Docker image that I untarred in here, but if you uh, like look in here, you see like the root file system. So it's pretty standard. Um, if we open up the config, so this all is like just setting up. Um, setting the process, it's like terminal is kind of equivalent to docker run dash t. Um, you can set what the user is going to be inside the container. You can set args that are going to run. These are environment variables, obviously, for a term. You can set read-only. Um, all the mounts that happen, these are like all the standard mounts. You um, are gonna, no matter what, want to mount proc um, inside the container. Otherwise, it will use the proc on the host, and then you can see everything in PS. Um, then standard stuff like dev devices and the containers, uh, shared memory, especially for IPC with MQ, um, sys, and the cgroup file system so that you can do cgroups within cgroups, which is really cool. Um, then I also just like bind in these so that I can get out via a gateway. Um, I also made this like super simple binary that um, just does basically what the Docker default bridge does, which if you're not familiar, it creates two VETH pairs on your host, clones one inside the container, and then um, these two do the communication for the container. And then it, uh, this actually renames the one inside the container to etho, because usually on your host it will show up something like this really long one is my Chrome that's currently running in a container. <laughs> so yeah, actually in the container itself, it shows up really nice, um, which I can actually show you too, but I'll do that later. So yeah, there's that, and that's just put in as a hook. And kind of the, the nicer thing about Run C versus Docker itself, I think, is hooks. Um, hooks would not be something that we're going to probably ever expose in Docker because it's a little bit like playing with fire. We set up the hooks for networking with libnetwork and um, all that stuff for the user in Docker so that nothing breaks, but um, it would be very easy to break something with this because the container will not stop, like will not start if the hooks fail. So you'd be pretty much done. Uh, you can set different capabilities. So this is like one of the layers of um, security in a container is setting the caps. Um, we have a few others too. Um, UID mapping. So this is what I was talking about with regard to like proc, PID, UID map. Um, so I'm setting the host container ID, this really long thing, to be zero inside the container. And then this size is actually like how far you can go up from there. So I can have like this number of user IDs inside the container, although one should never need that. Uh, same goes for groups. And then there's all sorts of like R limits, um, all the devices for C groups. These are all kind of hard to look at because they're all the major minor numbers, but there's actually a better part for it. These are all resources, CPU, all that that we talked about too. This decides um, like what is going to be all the namespaces. If you leave one out, it just won't do one, and I'll show that too. Um, so this is actually a better view of the devices. So you get like a dev zero, dev null in a container, all the things that you would need that are kind of standard. 
You random, random. Yeah, so AppArmor is actually a second layer of security too. We have an AppArmor profile that's default for containers if you have AppArmor installed. Um, it just like denies things like ptrace and things where there were like various kernel vulnerabilities to like break out of a container. We also have SE Linux, but I don't use that because I run Debian. Also, I'm like a sane person, so I don't use it. Um, and then we just added setcomp to Docker. And I'll show a demo of that too, because that was my patch. Um, but setcomp is really cool because it actually decides what syscalls can be run and can't be run in a container. Ours is a whitelist, um, which we actually started, the original patch was a blacklist, which is worse off, but to get something in, it was easier. Um, doing the whitelist, we had to include things like uh, Arch, various Arch syscalls for things on 32-bit, on ARM that like don't apply to anything else. So it was a lot of um, just running and seeing what we broke. It was super scary because we shipped this as a default profile. So if anybody like after the release, if we didn't catch them all the syscalls, they'd be like, yeah, my containers just won't start anymore. Getting like eperms all over the place. But luckily that did not happen because we tested enough. But yeah, uh, this is like super long. If you look, it's like we're on line 316. And then we're still there at the end at like line 1500. So yeah, that's pretty much your basic config, which is not so basic and super complicated. But we can run this container, which is say sudo run c start outline. So now I'm in the container, which is cool. And like everything is different. So see how like proc and sys are nobody, it's because we masked those paths, um, which is cool. But everything else is like this root, but this root is also mapped to something else. Um, so if we check out what pid that is, cool. So we have our dash, where is the other one? So this one is our process, so I'm gonna steal this. we can check out the UID map and it's really just a file with those values that we have in the JSON format, which is much more sane to look at. Nice, so it's the same thing. Um, but actually even more complicated is if we go into my Chrome config, because right now I am technically running that uh, slideshow originally in a container in run C. Um, so if we look at this config.json and we look at the UID mappings. Uh, so annoying. Here. Um, so I'm setting basically the UID mappings to the exact same as that Alpine container that was like super basic and standard. But the GID mappings I'm actually setting as um, super kind of custom. Um, and it looks weird because I have like 29, you know, mapped to 29 on the host. And that's actually my audio group. And then I have 44 mapped to 44 on my host. And that's my video group. So that in this Chrome container, I can actually, you know, like YouTube Taylor Swift and have sound working, hopefully. It's, so yeah, like, it's probably hard to hear, but yeah, that worked. And um, that wouldn't have worked if I did not map those specific groups to the ones on the host, because obviously they wouldn't have permission to use the like dev sound that I'm mounting in the container, uh, which is really cool. Um, and I figured this out actually when the Docker patch itself did not do that, and I kind of thought it should. So yeah, moving on, <laughs> slightly sidetracked. Okay, so 
the Alpine one was obviously like super, super basic and simple. Um, but just to show like what happens when you leave a uh, certain namespace out, like with regard to HTOP, like your main use case for HTOP would be, you know, obviously analyzing all the processes on your host. So um, for this one, like I left out a PID namespace. So it's doing like IPC, UTS, mount, and network, um, and, but not PID. So we start this. Uh, then obviously I can see everything, and that's really cool. Um, and that's kind of the difference of containers versus VMs, is a VM you can't share all the processes on your host, but have everything else separated. And the cool thing about containers is you can even take that a step further. So instead of just throwing in the host one in there, you can actually use the namespace from another container in a different container um, itself, which is now um, kind of in Docker via Docker run net, for example, container, then like the container name, which I can actually show with one. Um, so if I just show you all this so I don't have to type it out. So I have this like helper function that will um, start a Tor proxy in a container. Um, and it's just like named Tor proxy. It's going to mount local time and expose port 9050, which technically we wouldn't need to expose it since I'm going to run the next container in the port, but also that means that I can ping it for my host. So that's cool. And then this other thing is just adding a line to my um, host file so I can ping it from like Tor proxy. That ninety fifty. It's like a helper. Um, so yeah, I'll start that. Yeah. So that, those are just a ton of debug logs to show that it's starting. So then if I do this with like Docker run net container. Um, if I run just curl in here. No. Let me make the entry point sh. Wow. Ugh. Okay, so I'll curl like the sock for that via localhost. <coughs> I think that's the URL. Oh, false, shit. Well, that's awkward. Hang on. Let me try it for my host. Oh, it's because I did the wrong flag. Wow. OK. Well, let's just show it from here <laughs> so that I can also just prove to myself that it works. And then we could, we'll do it in the container again. What? It's this one. Okay, there is something wrong with that container, I think. Let me just try one more thing. Sorry, I'm not gonna give up on this just yet. <laughs> Until. That is so weird. OK, I think that that container just is broken in general with regards to routing through Tor. Um, so that sucks. You can use your imagination. <laughs> um, but yeah, so 
technically then you can use localhost as an alias in the container instead of having to do like links, which is kind of like an old thing that people would have to do and this just makes more sense. Um, so yeah, moving on to other things. Okay, so um, these are just like various things that I run in run C. Um, so you can even do stuff like um, Spotify, obviously, and um, uh, I can show that one. Um, actually, this one I'm going to show a different way. So in this directory, I also have this like run z add dot service. So if I like have that file, this is a systemd service in itself, um, and it's just starting the container and having a PID file, and then at the end, it cleans up and removes the PID file for it. Um, and it actually starts this in the background. So before, like, run C would have its process running, and then right under that would be the process that we actually started in the container. But this way, run C exits after it re-execs this other process, which is kind of cool. Uh, that way, you can, like, update the, the run C binary without getting, like, it's in use. Um, so, yeah. Cool. Um, I always forget my user ID because it's something really weird. <laughs> so yeah, so then you can um, use, this is Spotify running in a container, which is really cool. Uh, and I do this like whenever I use, uh, Spotify, same with the, you know, Chrome one that's running right now. And actually something that was just added was like sudo run C list, I think. Yeah, so it shows that I'm just like running those two. It's almost like a Docker PS. So these are like very similar, especially once you add in like my net and nest binary, which gives you like network in a container, um, which I actually didn't prove works, but uh, I can again. So I have an etho in here, which was done by this like small Go binary that just runs like netlink, uh, netlink like flags and stuff. So that's really cool. And run C is cool. It just takes all that effort with regard to the config file. Um, and it is nice because you can use that config file technically in the like grand aspect of when all this is done. You can use it to run like, you know, rocket containers and stuff like that, but it doesn't work today because they haven't like updated. Okay, but all those are really cool and all, but nobody is going to like download the rootfs and do all that work. So you can actually do the exact same things with Docker itself. Um, so I'll stop that instance of Spotify. Um, and just to show, like, you can do basically anything with this. Um, you can even run your uh, Pulse Audio daemon in a container, which seems a bit odd, but it, all it takes is mounting, like, dev sound into the container and then um, starting it from there. So all kind of the pain woes with regards to running Linux on the desktop kind of disappear. Um, at first, it, it, it was even worse, but now it's better. <laughs> uh, yeah. This is taking forever to stop, so I'm just gonna give up. But, so, uh, I can start Pulse Audio via this. Um, it's just mounting device dev sound, exposing this port, um, restart always, group add audio, and name Pulse Audio. So, pretty cool. And then actually what I can do is even run like, say, an NES game. Um, and use that same Pulse Audio to uh, have the sound for this game itself, uh, which is really cool. So I'll do that. I 
Actually, why is that one like that? No. Uh, actually, it was that one mounts sound itself, so I think it's VLC. Yeah, VLC will link the Pulse Audio container and use it, so I'll show that. Well, we can still show that NES game. Sorry. <laughs> so this is like a Nintendo simulator in a container, which is pretty cool. It works. <laughs> um, but yeah, we'll also do, let's see. So in my little helper, it would start Pulse Audio. I have all these like weird bash functions. But really the key here is, uh, oops. Key here is the like link of Pulse Audio into the container and um, adding the correct groups. Um, this is just a volume mount so that I can have like the volumes on my host in the container. And um, this is like uh, rendering um, for video and stuff. So it's nicer, and you can have like um, OpenGL. That's going to be downloading, so that's kind of a pain in the ass. Um, cool. OK. Let's see. So yeah, this is kind of like the more obscure ways to use Docker, but you can obviously use it um, for real production use cases. But most people are like more into this kind of stuff. And also, I'm giving a Docker tutorial itself on the more other, more practical use cases um, on, I think, Wednesday at 7. So you should come to that if you want like a more practical use case, because this is way more fun. Uh, so if we take a look at all these, <laughs> um, this just goes to show like how many different things that you can run. Like Audacity is like a voice recorder thing that I used for a podcast once. Um, Bees with machine guns is like something that will um, like DDoS a, a URL um, with uh, EC2 servers. Um, it's kind of a cool Python app if you've never seen it. Uh, C Advisor is actually Google's um, uh, container advisor um, app. It has a UI. It's pretty nice. Um, it's made by the same people, actually, that contribute to um, Run C itself. So it's really good. So all these things are crazy. I actually don't use Chrome via Docker anymore, though, since I showed you it's uh, through uh, Run C. Firefox, all that. So um, the actual key to these um, GUI apps is the X11 socket, which you know is not like the most secure thing in the world. Um, because there's key loggers and all that crap. But uh, there are like a few better ways to do it. It's just, it relies on stuff like Highland or uh, Wayland, which is not like exactly ready yet. Um, but once it is, I fully intend to make it worth with that. Um, but yeah, so there's a bunch of different stuff you can do, like GIMP. Okay, so moving on to other things added to Docker recently, um, because I think it was two weeks ago that we released Docker 110. And um, that had a lot of cool new features. Um, technically, user namespace support was in experimental long before that, but we shipped it in stable that time. And also, um, seccom support, which was uh, a patch that I wrote at DockerCon. Um, but the original patch to like run C and stuff was uh, done by my coworker, Michael. Um, so, um, with seccomp, like I explained that we have a default profile that you know is a whitelist and it has all this arch support and it's super long and super complicated. Oh cool, so VLC worked. Finally, it pulled the image. So that's proving <laughs> that. Um, but yeah, so we have the default one that runs, but you know, sometimes maybe one of the syscalls that we blocked you need to use. So as an example, for my Chrome container, um, I need to call clone of different new user namespaces, um, new net namespaces, all that because Chrome has a sandbox that actually almost uses 
container technologies, but really they're Linux kernel technologies. Um, so I had to like kind of fork the default profile and add in a couple of other things that we um, weren't whitelisting for specific reasons. Um, so you can actually pass like a custom seccom profile on run, which was the whole point of all that. Um, so for example, this like, call me maybe that JSON is, uh, it's doing a blacklist, allowing everything, but denying unshared just for the purpose of an example. Um, so just to show if I just run this normal container without, with, okay, so let's run it without the default profile, otherwise it's going to ruin the demo. So this is like using no set comp, <laughs> like not even the default profile, we're just gonna run it unconfined. Okay, so it worked and like, obviously it was not blocked because I would have gotten an EPIRM, but I'll show that if I actually pass this profile, then it will block it. So you get an EPIRM back right away. Um, and actually, so obviously it just like failed right away and exited with like, not much as to what is wrong, although technically it says unshare, but I think that's with regards to unshare the binary itself, not the syscall that it's making. Um, so debugging the default profile when people would hit eperms was maybe the most obnoxious thing ever. Um, but like Strace helps a lot. So um, since we also block unshare in the default profile, I'll just show that like this will work without all this crap too. So that's cool, but like we're just leaving the args empty if you look at what I did before. Um, this like arg stuff is empty and we're just kind of leaving it alone. But what you can do is more complicated blocks of things. So um, this is our default profile, um, and if we look, we actually have a super complicated like mask for clone itself, because clone will also like fork processes and start new threads, which we obviously can't block that. We need to allow that, but also deny like clone new NS, which is like cloning a new mountain in space. So this is a like masked um, mask check here, um, and this value is actually a really bad view of what it actually means. Let me show over here. Um, it, that's a bit mask of all the clone operations if we look in here. Yeah, so it's a bit mask of all the clone new namespace things, um, which is super cool. And these, like, Mass equal, there's also, you know, greater than, less than, um, equal to. Uh, so there's all sorts of various things you can do, because sometimes you want, you know, some flags on the syscall to be allowed and some not, uh, which it's, makes it way more flexible. So, yeah, this is all fine and great, but I honestly don't think anyone's going to, like, sit at home and write their own default set comp profile because for your own containers it takes a lot of hard work to get it to be just right and not many people are going to put up with that. So in the next version of Docker, hopefully it will be ready by then, um, I'm working on a patch for something better. <laughs> um, so this would be, um, actually I can just, it's terrible. 
it's going to be renamed, so don't remember that. Uh, <laughs> so this is a different type of, of uh, file format for security profiles, but I can just show what it will look like. So it will obviously check the version, but um, it will have this like concept of rules, and uh, this rule that's named like TMP here um, is a combination of different syscalls that define that behavior. So it gives like a more human interface to these like random syscalls that not many people know by heart. Um, and the same goes for networking. Uh, we're actually thinking of changing this so that it's not even like that. So that it's just like incoming and outgoing, uh, which makes it even more abstract, but also having maybe like a layer underneath it that is like this DNS ping type stuff. Um, runtime rules, like I honestly don't think most people know what malloc, like, so it will probably be more abstract than even that. <laughs> um, but yeah, so mostly it's abstracting in a way the complexity of things so that people know and can easily write what their app does because the person writing the app should be the one writing the security profile for it since they know best what it does. And I think in practice, like nobody's obviously writing custom app armor profiles, nobody's doing any of that. Um, and I actually tested all this stuff originally on a tool that generates a custom app armor profile for containers, because this was before we even had uh, second profiles. And it's called Bane. Um, and it just takes like a Toml config just like that um, and converts it into a custom profile, damn it. So this is an example for Nginx. Um, and that's not the one I wanted to click. Symbol of Toml. So um, you can set various things for the file system too, like these paths should be read only which is a little bit different than the dash dash read only flag. Um, it could give you like a whole nother layer of security if you use both. Um, but also if you only want some paths to be read only and some not, this helps a lot with that. Um, and doing this via app armor is just not fun. Uh, so this is like a little bit better. You can also have um, audits on, on write. So it will log in D message whenever you're writing something. And uh, things that can, so this path is allowed to write. Uh, this is allowed to exec. Um, you're not allowed to do these things. And yeah, capabilities. So like app armor is cool, but it also doesn't have all the like whole sec comp power. So this would kind of combine the two into this hybrid awesomeness. Um, but yeah. Pretty cool. Um, I think I'll take questions or show anything if anybody has it. Or I can keep rambling on about random stuff. <laughs> Even about like, um, with regards to like working in open source and stuff, because I mean, I'm sure you guys are like thinking about what you're gonna do next. Like I'll answer anything about that too. Okay, I mean, I will just say, like, um, what I've seen happen on the project a lot um, is, because we have maintainers that started actually as individuals, and they would uh, contribute a ton of code, and then all of a sudden, like, Red Hat would, like, hire them. So, I don't know, I mean, if you're looking for a job, that's kind of a cool idea. Um, also, we try to poach people who contribute a lot, too. Um, I wasn't trying to make that, like, an ad, but yeah. <laughs> So, and uh, contributing to open source is really fun. It has its days that are like really annoying and you have to review someone's like super shitty patch and they don't understand. Um, but it's also fun being able to work with people like all around the country because all of us are on IRC at various times throughout the day. So even if I like can't sleep at night and I'm just bored, like someone is always there in our like maintainers channel just like doing something. And I don't know, we kind of became friends, so it's cute. Um, you get to meet people and hang out with them at like conferences and stuff. <laughs> Any 